Um, and now I'm going to move ahead and to introduce our panel of speakers. So we have five excellent speakers today. Firstly, Ambassador Fergal Maiden has been the permanent representative of Ireland to the United Nations since August 2022. He has recently served as Director General of the Irish, UK and America's Division in the Department of Foreign Affairs. He led the departmental team working on the Northern Ireland peace process, Irish-British relations and Irish-US and Irish-Canadian bilateral relations, as well as relations with the Latin America Caribbean region. Mona Ahmed Al Shawa has been the director of the Women's Rights Unit of the Palestinian Centre for Human Rights since, since March 2004. She graduated from Birzeit University in the West Bank and started her career in PCHR as a researcher in 1997. She leads activities and conducts training sessions on human rights, women's rights and gender. And Mona is also a member of PCHR's General Assembly of Shareholders. Charlene Bangley is an assistant project manager specializing in conflict, gender and disaster risk reduction, working with Concern Worldwide in the Central African Republic. Charlene has a background in sociology and her work experience ranges from raising awareness about reproductive health with the Central African Civil Society Association to providing psychosocial support with Fracarita. Charlene began her work with Concern Worldwide in 2019. And Leila El Ali is a Palestinian feminist and political activist. She is a gender advisor and a promoter of Palestinian national and human rights with a particular focus on women. She's been the executive director of Associa Association Najde, a, a development NGO that works with women and children in refugee camps in Lebanon since 2004. She has been co-president of Euromed Feminist Initiative, which is a feminist policy and advocacy network since 2014. And finally, our last panelist is Pablo Castillo Diaz, who is a policy specialist on peace and security at UN Women. Women. And he works to achieve advances in policy positions on WPS from UN Women level. And he has a passion for achieving gender equality. And of course, Pablo, like all of our speakers today, is passionate about that cause. So I am going to move straight into the discussion with the panel members. So Ambassador Fergal Michael, I'm going to come to you first. And unfortunately, the two years have gone very fast, and mm -hmm. so it might mm -hmm. seem to us on the outside. I'm sure it doesn't seem quite the same to, to you and members of your staff. But maybe if I could ask you just a couple of questions and, and to contribute on. So firstly, what from your perspective are the key contributions that Ireland made as a member of the UN Security Council? And what lessons have been learned by Ireland um, that could potentially be taken forward by other UN member states and civil society. And you might in particular think about how you've contributed towards ensuring accountability to women and girls with respect to GBV during the term. Over to you, Fergal. Thank you very much, Quiva, And it's a real uh, pleasure to be here today and to be taking part in this discussion. And a huge thank you to the consortium for hosting this event and indeed for your work with us over the past two years. I've taken over here from um, our previous Ambassador Geraldine Bornason, who really, you know, wanted to prioritise women, peace and security and gender based violence as an issue for our for our term on the Security Council. And I've taken that for taken forward that work since August. Um, as I say, the consortium have been valuable advocates during our term on the Council, including those consultations with civil society ahead of each meeting of the Security Council's informal expert group on women, peace and security. And as you said, Quiva, those reports were shared with our team in Dublin and here in New York and really helped to inform our engagement with that expert group. As I said, from the very start of our term and even beforehand in planning, we really sought to prioritize the, the women, peace and security agenda. Uh, and as part of that, as you mentioned, we took on the role of co-chair of the informal expert group alongside Mexico. Um, just to give some sense of, of what the IEG is, what the informal, the informal expert group is, it's, it's a subsidiary body of the Security Council, which provides a forum for Security Council members to have really frank and open discussions with UN leadership on the ground in places like Afghanistan, Somalia, Haiti. Um, in, you know, they're just some examples of where we've had those really close discussions with UN personnel on how they're addressing the situation for women and girls and advancing the WPS agenda on the ground in their areas of operation. 
And then this in turn helps to bring a, a women peace security lens to all of our security council discussions. I think um, as we reflect on our, on our two years, now we're not finished yet, we're still working away till the end of this year and there's a number of very important files we're working on, including the uh, Syria humanitarian uh, access resolution and indeed seeking a carve out, a humanitarian carve out for all uh, sanctions regimes. So our work isn't completed, but we are reflecting on what we've, we've achieved uh, and maybe also what we failed to achieve in the past two years. And we really work to see the WPS agenda mainstream throughout all Security Council discussions in a very real and meaningful way. Uh, back in September 2021, uh, during our presidency of the Security Council, we joined forces with Kenya and launched the WPS presidency trio. And this was essentially a set of commitments that we would adopt during our presidency uh, which had a number of commitments. One, to bring far more women to the council as briefers and to ensure that WPS was meaningfully included across all geographic discussions and outcomes, products of the council. So during our presidency, just to give an example of that, 16 of the 17 civil society briefers we invited to the council were women. This was the highest number ever. And I think it's important to reflect that as recently as the 1990s, there were no women civil society briefers invited to the council. So this was an important uh, initiative of visibility and um, giving a voice to, to women in, in very, very challenging situations across the globe and bringing that, that experience right into the heart of the council discussions. Secondly, we also requested that UN briefers coming from in the UN secretariat would include gender analysis in their briefings. And so ensuring that, that geographic debates had a WPS focus. Uh, for example, we hosted a debate on Somalia during our presidency, which focused primarily on the, the situation of women and girls in that, in that country. Since Ireland and the TRIO started this initiative in September 2021, that's with Mexico and Kenya, the WPS shared commitments have been built upon and adopted by a total of 14 council members including incoming members for, for next year, for the next two years, the 2023-2025 term. And I think that's very important to ensure that this isn't just a one-off initiative, but that it's mainstreamed and hardwired into the work of the council into the future. Uh, a second aspect of this work was our co-chairing of the informal expert group on WPS with Mexico. And I think we really sought to be ambitious and creative in this role. We held a record 18, 18 meetings uh, with detailed reporting and analysis in more country situations than ever before, including Somalia, Lebanon, Haiti, and in the Palestinian context. We also led the first ever WPS field visit of the group to Lebanon, which helped to better familiarize council members, i.e. those who are doing the negotiating, uh, with how WPS language in Security Council mandates can have tangible and real impact on the ground for women and girls. And I think for us, it's always been about translating words in resolutions and words in statements into meaningful impact for people on the ground across the globe. So that's very, very important for us. And then finally, uh, in follow up to what we heard during our formal expert group meetings, uh, we engaged in active advocacy efforts in our own right. Uh, and two quick examples of this were following the decree in May by the Taliban to force women to cover their faces in public we wrote immediately to the council president condemning this action and urging the council to take a unified position on this, on this issue. And more recently, we wrote to the new Colombian government to urge them to implement the gender dimensions of the Colombian peace process agreement. So under all these headings, we really work actively and consistently and continuously to ensure that the WPS agenda was giving meaningful reflection in the work of the council. As I said, even when we, we step off the council at the end of this month, uh, we hope and we will work to ensure that our work does not end there. Uh, we'll continue to be fierce advocates of the WPS agenda. And we're already engaging with the incoming chair, co-chairs of the informal expert group, encouraging a similar level of ambition uh, within that group and to ensure continued engagement with civil society. Uh, only last week, as we concluded our term as co-chairs of the expert group, we met with the UN Secretary General, uh, Antonio Guterres, to highlight the importance of mainstreaming the WPS agenda through the work of the Council, and to, to encourage him to make women's participation in UN-led 
peace process to be a reality. And in fairness, he acknowledged that we've made some progress, but far too often uh, when we see negotiating teams in peace processes, women are absent. And that's a real challenge to the UN system, which he, he acknowledged and really will, will continue to work on in the period ahead. So that's just a kind of an out, an out, a broad outlay of, of the work we've done in relation to the WPS agenda. Kriva, do you want me to go on to um, the issue of account accountability or? Yeah, I'm I think Fred, if you there. could say, no problem. If you could say a little bit more about the challenges that you experienced. So I think you've laid out very clearly like the effort, the strong effort that Irish has made, Ireland has made. But I think it would be interesting to hear your reflections on um, what were maybe some of the obstacles that you encountered in, in trying to have the, you know, in, in some ways, the um, very welcome uh, words <laughs> translated into yes. practical actions and practical outcomes on the ground um, and what your learnings are around that. And then maybe yes, if you could comment on, because this is connected to accountability, how that um, both currently, but maybe more importantly in the future, how that could be strengthened so as to strengthen accountability. Yeah, well, maybe I'll start with accountability first and then we'll come back to some learnings yeah. which we're which kind of gathering. I mean, for us, I mean, obviously, and for yourselves, accountability is a crucial factor in the fight against gender-based violence. And, and very often we, we, we see all too frequently that accountability and justice for survivors of gender-based violence is not guaranteed in any shape or form. Uh, we've addressed this through our IEG briefings, through advocacy and through sanctions regimes. Uh, and as co-chairs, we held two meetings with a particular focus on conflict-related sexual violence. We also sought to bring senior women protection officers from UN missions across the world to brief the group to really highlight this issue. Um, women protection advisors, or WPAs, uh, you know, for us play an instrumental role in the UN's response to gender-based violence and conflict-related sexual violence. In a sense, they're on the front lines of addressing such violence and trying to prevent it. And they've really helped inform council members of the tangible impact of including provision for such advisors and UN mandates. And again, that's not always easy to get there. It's not always a given. And we've had to work hard to ensure that there is provision for WPAs in UN mandates. And again, we hope these, this, this engagement with WPAs in the field will become a, a, a regular feature of the, of the uh, Security Council calendar. Just in terms of advocacy, I think we've really spoken out against gender-based violence in contexts such as Ukraine, Ethiopia, and Afghanistan. Uh, and you know, for us, the biggest threat to these, you know, you know, the biggest threat in many ways in these situations is that these acts of violence go unnoticed and are not condemned and are not highlighted and are not brought to the attention of council members. Um, also for us, sanctions regimes are very, very important in this field in terms of ensuring accountability. Uh, and we've really worked to ensure accountability mechanisms in relation to gender-based violence uh, in the new sanctions regime on Haiti, as well as in Yemen. Uh, and also we, we chaired the sanctions committee for Somalia, and that's where we really, we really sought to uh, ensure that gender-based violence is on the agenda there. I think in terms of challenges, it's, um, it's not that there's, you know, like, we, we look now that the clearly the Security Council has challenges in terms of, of the fact that Russia, a P5 member with a veto, is on the council and can block work, not just in relation to Ukraine, but in relation to other parts of, of the of the agenda. And, and relationships are challenged by that situation. Uh, and last year we saw that we, we, we really worked hard with Niger to bring forward a, a resolution on security and climate change. And that was vetoed by Russia. So we, we face challenges. The Women, Peace and Security agenda probably doesn't face that, that strong geopolitical challenge, but it does face perhaps indifference or a sense of, well, this isn't central to the work of the Security Council and Peace and Security. So for us, it's really been working hard to, to you know, to use that word mainstream. I know it gets used a lot and it gets, gets bandied about a lot, but it's really important that it's hardwired into the work and the con consciousness of the Security Council and its members and that that's sustained from you know from year to year as the membership changes as the as the elected members change every five every every year you know a new five members come on five members leave and for us it was really hardwiring the WPS agenda and as, as a subset of that the issues in relation to gender-based violence sexual violence and conflict are not are, are kept on the on the to the forefront of the council's work 
are not forgotten about or, or in some ways just um, uh, patronized, but not really hardwired in. And that's why it was important for us to have actions like those women protection advisors and UN missions, why it's in the sanctions regimes, why we're, we're, we're engaging in an expert way with UN uh, officials in the field, just asking them to really account for their work in, in this area and then to make sure that they're aware of it and it's, it's to the forefront of their work as they as they operate in Kabul or, or, or um, elsewhere. So it, it's, it's, it's that hardwiring mainstream and keeping it going. And as I say, it's, it's not that we've faced huge geopolitical resistance, but there can be indifference or a sense this isn't, this isn't central to the work of the Security Council, um, which is a very male perspective, as you can imagine, you know, uh, sitting around the table and we talk about great issues of peace and security, but this that gets, gets left to one side. And that's the challenge. And for us, going off the Council, we feel we've, we've done a lot to ensure it is mainstreamed into the future, but we have to keep a strong eye on that. And, and civil society has a very strong role to play in that as well. Thank you, Quiva. Excellent, Fred. Well, thank you very much. And, and hopefully when we come to the Q&A, we can come back and unpack a little bit that, of that. And it would certainly be interesting to get your sense of whether, you know, two years on, do you feel um, the agenda has inched forward a little bit or has it remained the same or, or has it gone backwards? Because I think we all know and acknowledge that um, within the broader UN system, there's huge pressure on gender equality in general, but also on an acknowledgement of the importance of um, gender-based violence and the importance of the protection agenda, the WPS agenda, but maybe let's come back to that after we've heard the rest of our panel speakers. And I'm really honoured now to introduce the first of our panel speakers who participated in the listening sessions, and that's Mona Al-Shawa, Director of the Women's Rights Unit of the Palestinian Centre for Human Rights. Mona, you are so welcome. It is wonderful to see you again, and you've been a consistent, um, I suppose, voice that we have tried to elevate because it is both so important and so eloquent in terms of being able to talk about the issues that you face, that women face in your context, um, and what you think is important in terms of accountability. So maybe, Mona, first of all, if I could just ask you the question um, of maybe if you could remind us what are the key issues in your context, especially in terms of accountability to women and girls affected by gender-based violence. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and at the outset, allow me to thank you for giving me uh, this opportunity to speak to you today at this important event. It's a privilege to be with you as a speaker, to make the voices of Palestinian women be heard at this time in the, in the year. When voices all over the world are raised to end violence against women and girls within the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. This campaign comes this year while we as a Palestinian women live under exceptional circumstances where we face mul multiple and interacting levels of violence and persecution. Violence practiced by the longest occupation in the modern history, which is the Israeli occupation, and violence practiced by the society who's based on patriarchy, discrimination, and inequality, rending post inseparable. The Israeli occupation has escalated violence in the Palestinian society, affecting all the society, not only women. However, women are imposed to double violence under this policy because of their social role and position are already marginalized. Hence, the Israeli occupation contributes to perpetuating and to the marginalization of women directly and indirectly. The Israeli occupation is also considered as one of women's biggest challenge, challenges and the main reason behind violations of women's security and rights. As the occupation continues, the, its systematic and escalating violations as a Palestinian woman are targeted directly through killing, arrest, or abuse, and indirectly through killing or arresting family members or demolishing houses or other violations committed on a daily basis. Since the beginning of this year, the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, has witnessed increasing violations of the right of life as the Israeli occupation forces attack have killed 120 
civilians, including eight women and 35 children. Most prominently was the murder of the journalist Shireen Abu Akli, Al Jazeera Channel reporter, who was killed while her, she was in her duty. Also, the demolition and uh, land raising, um, construction, and the settlement activities continued displacing 100, 137 families, including 158 women. The Israeli occupation also continued to arrest women as 40, 45 were arrested this year. This violation consists with the Israeli occupation forces ongoing restriction on the freedom of movement in the West Bank also. On the other hand, the occupation authorities are still keeping 33 women at, uh, um, and minors under arrest in Damon prison, including 16 female prisoners who suffer from deliberate medical neglect under inhuman condition. As for Gaza Strip, uh, I have to mention that I'm from Gaza. Uh, the Israeli occupation forces has imposed a comprehensive closure for 16 years, restricting the freedom of movement for individual and goods, which is considered form of collective punishment, keeping more than 2 million Palestinians live under an, oil, an open air prison and suffer from major economic and the humanitarian crisis. The closure has a greater impact on women as it restricts their ability to obtain the basic and necessary living standards to maintain a human dignity in light of context shortage of electricity, clean water, and, med and, med and medicine supplies. In addition to the Israeli imposed closure, the Gaza Strip has been subject to five military offensives for 12 years. In 2008, 2012, 2014, May 2021, and the last one was in August 2022, and we don't know if it is the last or when it will be the next. No one has guaranteed that it is the last. All the time, we are waiting for the next. The later one killed the 12 Palestinian civilians, including three women. And the frequent offensive have inflicted inflicted thousands of civilian killing and injured among Palestinians, destroyed the infrastructure and thousands of houses, and displayed thousands of families. It's worth, no it's worth noting that although Gaza Strip is considered one of the most populated areas in the world, and it, there is many offensive happened. It, it, there is no shelters in Gaza, and there is no. We don't have any safe places. So Gaza, there is no safe places or shelters. Any offensive usually has a gender-based cons uh, consequences that have not received much attention, despite their importance. Women who are victims of discrimination in time of peace become in times of, of conflict and post-conflict more vulnerable to poverty, marginalization, and suffering because they are the main caregivers in their families. Most of women of these women are struggling to survive in the time where hundreds of them have become widows and lost their children and houses which are their source of safety as well as uh, their livelihood. Moreover, gender-based violence often uh, uh, increase in the time of conflict and women's special needs remain largely neglected in the post-conflict times and during the planning phase of recovery because women are unfortunately excluded from participating in decision maker at all levels although they are among the group most affected by the conflict and its consequences. On the other hand, the Palestinian women face GBV uh, targeted by the patriarchal society. Violence and its all forms in Palestinian society remain high and women are still being killed on different grounds. Although violence cases have increased, 
the Palestinian society still has a lack of social and legal protection uh, for women. Unfortunately, and for many years, the Israeli occupation has given the green light to act with impunity. Thus, it, thus it violated the rules of international humanitarian law and the human rights law and committed many crimes that amount to war crimes and the crimes against the humanity. Also, abs also, uh, also absence of accountability or punishment over the past years has encouraged the Israeli occupation to commit more of these crimes. From this platform, I will send my messages if you allow me. I ask Ireland as a member of Security Council to enforce accountability and to bring justice and protection to victims of women and girls who are suffering from the Israeli violations and violence. It's time to end the impunity. It's time to start the persecution of, Israel, of the Israeli war crimes, just like any other war criminal proposed by the international justice system. It's time to stop applying double and selective standards. It's time to hear the voices of women, or the Palestinian women, who yearn for justice and the, and, and the protection, to provide life testimonies of their grave violation they subjected to. It's time to discuss Palestine when we discuss peace and security. And it's time to discuss Palestinian women concern when we discuss women, peace and security. Thank you. Mona, thank you very much. I think you've laid out very clearly for us what the issues are facing women. And I suppose for, for many people, when we think about Israel and Palestine, it's the um, the violations that affect everyone come to mind. But as you've so clearly said, these violations disproportionately affect women in so many ways. Where there is conflict, conflict inevitably results in an increase in gender-based violence. Where there is poverty, um, poverty you know, increases gender-based violence. And of course, I mean, I, I visited your organization in the Gaza Strip, so I can add to your testimony if I had time, but um, I want to move on to our next speaker. Um, but I think the participants on the, in this group would be very well aware of the intensity of the conflict that results in an intense violation of rights for women in particular. So thank you very much. I think you've been very clear as well in your, your asks, which are around enforcing accountability and um, reinforcing the value of hearing the voices of women directly, particularly perhaps, if I may add, in a highly politicized conflict that has been going on for many, many years. And you also mentioned that women are excluded from decision making in process that are around looking at conflict resolution. So there is work to be done on many fronts there. But we might get back to some of these issues and again how Ireland, both civil society and the Irish government and the Irish Defence Forces, who are also a member of the, um, the Gender Based Violence um, Consortium, how can we contribute um, and how can we respond to all of your requests. But it's now my privilege to introduce Charlene Bangby. Charlene works for Concern Worldwide in the Central African Republic. She's the Assistant Project Manager on Conflict, Gender and Disaster Risk Reduction. Now we're really hoping that the internet connectivity works and that we can hear from Charlene. Charlene, can you hear me? Is Charlene with us? Oui, je vous entends. Merci. Excellent, excellent. Yes, okay. I can hear you. I'm, I'm with you. I can hear you. Charlene, you are very I welcome. I'm, I actually, I am so happy to be able to participate in this activity. For me, be able to, to see this group that is taking interest into our issue in the women or in Central Africa is, is really touching to see that you are interested in our suffering. And I'm happy to participate in today's session. Thank you, Charlene. And I think, yes, of course, the Central African Republic and, and the issues affecting Central African Republic do not often appear on the international agenda, which is a crime in itself. 
But Charlene, if I may ask you the same questions as I asked Mona, if you could maybe remind us what the key issues are in your context in terms of gender-based violence and how it affects women and girls, and also what should be the priorities for Ireland in pushing for accountability to women and girls affected by gender-based violence? And I'm hoping Charlene is still with us. Uh, sorry, you were back. I'm sorry, I need to remove my video so, so that you can hear me properly. That's no problem. I am so happy to be able to participate to this activity. And I think that the participation of uh, in the protection of women and, and young girls is something important because I I am a part of it. I am a I am a woman. I am part of the women and girls that suffer these violences every single day. And I think that this situation has become dire more and more. And this situation has made that the women are are always making steps backwards and they cannot uh, keep going forward because they are vulnerable. They don't have the capacity to be capable uh, to take uh, account accountability on their own lives. So I think, and I really wanted to underline the fact that the women are victims every single day and they don't have the capacity to uh, denounce these questions and they say stop because of their children or because they don't have the capacity to take their issues into hand and they are forced uh, to 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 suffer this and i think that in uh, our uh, cra this is a question the domestic violence is not being considered in the level of the pol police is very different to put this into into the public eye and there are different types of uh, uh gbv that are uh, that are frequent here there is uh, emotional violence sexual violence socio-economical violence domestic violence is quite frequent here and i think this has really made it so that we are scared as women that we are scared to go out we are scared to go forward we are scared to do normal life things and there are lots of barriers that are in front of us that make it impossible for us to go forward and in the level of our village for example there was a young girl that goes to school uh, has what has been raped and this happened uh, in the, they are she was taken and violated by various men and the parents don't have the courage uh, to go to the police and denounce these terrible acts so this young girl does not have the psychological help that she needs and the other services that she might access to. So I think that we need to fight so that we can we need to have access to these services so that people uh, take take their hand in uh, take it into their own hands. It is hard to believe people when people say they are raped. There are people that ask, ask a lot of questions about this question. You are asked to bring some proofs and this is it's very hard to bring proofs when you are a victim to this. I had a training session with uh, local actors and GBV actors and there was a policeman that was saying that normalized the fact that there has a violence between a man and a woman because it is a family issue that it, they need to um, resolve this in, in a friendly way. So I we need to work on this to protect the population when the population sees that the what they there are these injustices that happen and that the perpetrator is safe. Uh, how can you say that the in, inside the family, the, fam the violence that occurs is normal. How is the population going to be able to be secure when the people that are the forces of order, the, peop the people that are supposed to protect them, so us as humanitarians, we are supposed to ask uh, the people for their, their, their vision on this. Do they want uh, to bring the... But as a policeman, you have the right to stop the person that it perpetrates violence against another person. And it is 
impossible to say that this per person is telling us that it's a familiar a problem that needs to be solved in private. And then this makes me very, very sad. And I hope that we can go forward in this question. That's why I said that I was going forward to the policemen and tell them that they need to have a training sessions about this question. And it's important to do this, do this so you they can access these questions. I also give my own personal case. I'm sorry, I'm giving you my own example. I am also a victim of uh, conjugal vis uh, violence. My husband was violent towards me. He beat me and I had the courage to go to the police and denounce these acts. People would say, how is it possible that I could do this? And people saw me as not normal and they would judge me when I went to the police. But I was saying at the level of police, we explained the fact Facts. and they told me that next next time if this uh, if this happened they are going to take them into custody and i think that since they he never raised his hand on me again if the if women have the courage to denounce these terrible acts this is going to help them and it's going to soft soft stop the violence that people are perpetrating against the women it's difficult to go forward and denounce this but because I took the courage to do it and stand up for myself, he never raised his head again uh, upon me again. So women need to work to get us as suffering women. I say we because I am a part of these women and I'm going to keep fighting until I can't fight anymore because I, I am here so we can speak about all of the violence that we live in our own context. There are many women that have mental health issues, heart issues, and this also needs to be brought forward. There are more, more children that have these issues because there are people that say, I don't have the possibility to take myself into my own hands. So I I I just I don't have the capacity to go ahead and say I'm not doing well and the parents are saying once you are married you have to stay there you have to endure these violence so and it's the same thing for the people that the young girls that are going to school they are they need to walk long paths and they are violated and they stop their studies because of this because they are scared to be violated on their way to school and we need to and the rapist is going to is it's is going to be in, in, immune to this and women could not uh, suggest could not bear that the person uh, that raped the woman was still married to this woman and this is forced marriage and she this woman had to stop her studies because she had to remain married to the person who raped her and i think that for the violence in the conjugal level it's so so um, extended in our region that women don't have the courage to say no, to say they need to stop. They don't have this courage. So I think it is a big, big fight that we need to uh, we need to uh, bring together to these women. So we need to encourage women and empower me, women. And even for myself, I needed to take this decision that I needed to go to the police and denounce my husband. And I also, I had those fears that he would no longer lo uh, love me, but we came home together and he took conscience of his actions and he never raised his hand upon me again. So women need to take this into account and realize that it is an empowering action and since women don't have enough activities they are forced to endure these situations so i think that this fight we're going to lead it together and i'm going to give you a few recommendations so that that the government could really help us so we can have solutions to this question maybe in uh, 10 years 20 years women are can endure these questions uh, the people in uh, central africa we need to create a real work of sensitive uh, sensitive sensitive uh, sensitization of the community if these women don't come forward and all of these processes don't happen. So we need to create conscience and empower women. So I think there are women uh, 
that work in law that have different activities perhaps they are uh, advocates if we can help them so that we can stop uh, just the promises and go ahead and help these women empower these women even in in this a reduced level even inside of our, our village just empower these women so we can really create conscience of these issues in a in a legal level we need to do every everything so that the these people are san sanctioned and we have real justice because being raped and seeing the rapist still walking free in front of you it's very hard so these people need to be judged need to be sanctioned and also in psych in psychology and social and economic violence we all we need to take in health most of all is the most important thing i think there are many people there are many people that um many things that we we need to create conscience so my, the main focus is in uh, cre ad, uh, creating advocacy and creating conscience of these questions so that we can lead in this fight and i'm going to do uh, everything I can inside of my family, inside of my um, my close circle, I talk about these issues so that I can really su support the people around me around this so that we can have a holistic approach and that we can face these issues so that we can say that everything happened and it's we we don't we can't look at this violence and be inert so we keep fighting uh, for women's safety charlene thank you very much and firstly thank you for sharing your personal story with us um which is extremely painful for you i'm sure um but i think we can all understand how the injustice done against you is firing your drive to achieve justice for other women and indeed to prevent the injustices happening in the first place I think you've been very clear that there's a need for prevention. There's a need, from what I hear, for wide social norm change, changes in understanding, in attitudes and behaviours towards women and towards girls um, to reduce that or eliminate that normalisation of violence, um, including domestic violence and intimate partner violence. You've been very clear on that. And I think you've been very clear as well that there needs to be an investment in pathways, both for services in response to gender-based violence, but also really importantly, access to justice for survivors of violence. And that it, it is possible, this is not an impossible um, wish or desire, but of course it will take time. As you said, it, it is a long-term wish that there will be a transformation both at social level, but also service provision and judicial level and within the police. So I think we've heard you very, very clearly and, and thank you again for sharing that with us. I think we'll move on now to our third speaker who participated in the listening sessions. And I'm very happy to welcome Leila El Ali, who's executive director of Association Najde and is based in Lebanon and working in the refugee camps uh, with refugees from Palestine. Um, and just, just by way of note, it was interesting that Ambassador Fergal Maitham, just in the introduction, mentioned that Ireland had um, you know, had paid particular attention to a number of countries and they would have included, of course, Palestine, but also Lebanon and led on a mission to Lebanon. So Leila, I think we'd be very interested in also hearing from you on that question of what are the key issues in your context? And then what do you think the priorities should be for Ireland? What should we continue to do, continue to press um, or do more of or encourage others to do more of or do differently? So Leila, the floor is yours. Thank you and thank you for the invitation for the second time to be part of this uh, discussion forum. Oh, it was a pleasure for me also to, to meet the, the mission who came to Lebanon in one of the Palestinian camps in Beirut, where uh, we have talked a lot about uh, 1325, the gaps of it, and also the current situation of the Palestinian refugee women in the camps, which is more complicated now. They are more subjected to all types of violence. Allow me, first of all, to talk about the gaps that we have experienced, especially during the last uh, two years since COVID and the different crises that we passed this through in Lebanon, uh, as refugees and as women in general. From our experience and the 1325, we have noted, first of all, 
uh, as a refugees, uh, as a refugee woman, we are not under the mandate of uh, the, the NAP, the Lebanese National uh, NAP, excluding from the services uh, perspective from uh, UNRWA side. I mean, that services that should be provided through the UN agency uh, specialized to work with the Palestinians in Lebanon. Otherwise, Palestinian women, they are excluded from any type of the, from any pillars, I have to say, of the 1325. Unfortunately, at another level, the Palestinian refugees also, refugee women, were excluded from the Palestinian map because the Palestinian map is focusing mainly on the women in West Bank and Gaza. Thus, we are lost as refugees. So this is because our refugee status that is uh, not ensuring us safety, security, and all types of protection that the 1325 or other uh, resolutions related to women should ensure to women. We are not residents, we are not uh, citizens, we are stateless in, uh, in the country. Because we are stateless, we are prohibited from any kind of protection, justice, support, even human rights in the country. With the COVID, as everywhere, the poverty was increased and un un unemployment also increased. So that also doubled within the Palestinian community. What is also important to note is that the violence against women, mainly GBV, if you are talking about the GBV, from our data and women attending our centers to be, to be supported, uh, we have reported that the violence GBV was increased more than 60% during 60% during the six year, uh, uh, months of the, of the beginning of, uh, of COVID-19. Coming back to, to this uh, GBV and the protection, uh, unfortunately, I have to say also that the UNRWA, UN agency to support uh, UN, uh, what it called UN, uh, United Nations for Relief and Work for Palestinians in the Near East. This is its full name. UNRWA, unfortunately also, in all its services, it's not mandate in mainstreaming gender equality and uh, uh, GBV uh, in order to prevent it. It's not only this, I have to say during this year campaign, 16, 16 days of uh, campaign, while we had the collective campaign, UNRWA was part of it, because there was a threat and, a, and attack against all women's rights NGOs in the Palestinian camps, the UNRWA was the first one to withdraw from the campaign and was the first one to stop all GBV activities, gender equality, child protection, even PSS activities at schools, which is not understandable by UN, UN agency committed to uh, to promote gender equality uh, and to promote equality between minimum girls and uh, and boys. Uh, uh, within this whole complicity, I have to say also that uh, we have to notice that the space is the shrinking against us as a women's rights NGOs and as human rights defenders. At the national level, by all the steps and the restrictions imposed on the women's rights NGOs, starting from the banking system, ending by physical threats for staff and individuals as women rights activists. We had a big, we had a big campaign in the Palestinian camps for this campaign, I mean 16 days campaign. And we have been attacked uh, badly, aggressively, I have to say, without any interference from the Lebanese side or from even PLO side. So as you can see, because we don't have any status in all of this, we are left alone without any protection, as said, 
this kind of security or safety and the protection cannot be secured without having our self-determination or our right to return. This is uh, first. Uh, I'll come back to the uh, 1325 because I'm speaking about all of this, which is a lot of uh, the key messages that I raised right now are not uh, 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 included or uh, are not observed or, or uh, integrated within the 1325, I have to say. 1325 mainly talking about, uh, well, clearly about conflict and uh, the role of women in the peace negotiation process, so everything around that. Even if it has clear pillars to prevent the GBV and other kind of violence against women, but there are a few or, or important key things should be noted and integrated uh, uh, within the, the frame of the 1325, within the mandate, I mean, of the 1325. First, it should be considering all types of the crisis. This is first. When I'm talking about crisis, I mean whether this is the uh, natural crisis or biological crisis or health crisis like COVID, etc. In Lebanon, there was the big explosion, etc. This is one. Because I, I believe that we have to broaden and even the def def definition of the crisis. It's not only conflict or specific or armed conflict. There are different types of conflicts that should be mainstreamed within the the 1325. Second, it should be tackled not only the citizen, citizens, generally speaking, but also the residents of the country, such as the refugees in Lebanon or displaced uh, women in Lebanon, because there are a lot also of displaced women in Lebanon, Syrian, Iraqi, etc. So this is another uh, key issue. The third issue, I believe that uh, there should be a kind of enforcement for all countries to, to, to elaborate and adopt NAPs with related budget, because it is, it's not only important to, to have the, the NAPs, most importantly that there is budget allocated to implement these. So most of the countries who are elaborating the NAPs, unfortunately, including Palestine, there is no budget for the implementation of the NAPs. So it should be uh, obligatory also with any NAP to have the budget. From our experience also, this should be also linked with the obligatory follow-up monitoring and accountable accountability system, monitoring uh, system. Well, I believe the reports are so important, but it's not enough for countries to report on, on this. So a lot of uh, work I, I, I know should be done uh, on this. Uh, I don't know what, what kind of uh, recommendation I should uh, raise in relation to UNRWA, unfortunately, because it's a UN agency. They cannot withdraw, leave us alone when we are confronting a huge attack and when our lives are threatened, which is really, it's not frightening because it is well known that we are, we are strong. We are a strong woman, I mean, but we need that, that kind of uh, uh, preventive measures, preventive forces to protect us as humanitarian workers, as women's rights uh, workers and, and uh, defenders. So more core on, on the prevention or more work with the UN agencies in order that they have to be obliged to implement everything related to the UN resolutions. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Leila, thank you so much. And, you know, each one of you, the three speakers we've just had, Mona, Charlene and Leila, paint a very vivid picture of quite different environments, but within which similar violations happen. Um, it's quite striking to hear you speak about the experience of being stateless, because in truth, people who are stateless um, don't have the protection of a state. Therefore, they are entitled to the protection of the international system. But it sounds like this is falling down very, very badly in the case of Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. And I would add that is quite possibly also the case for, as you mentioned, displaced women in Lebanon, Syrian refugees in Lebanon also. Um, and this is not only a Lebanese issue, but I think, you know, stateless people deserve the full protection of the international community. That goes without saying, but it's certainly not happening. And I think you're making recommendations there around how the UN system needs to step up and UN agencies need to be encouraged or enabled, maybe through budgets, maybe through stronger mandates to step up on prevention and protection. And I'm very happy, therefore, to introduce Pablo Castillo-Diaz, because Pablo, you're within the UN system, but you're also at a very, I suppose, um, you're in a privileged position in that in your work as policy specialist on women, peace and security, you would be both an advocate for WPS and for its implementation, and you'll be able to observe what member states, including Ireland, I presume, are doing on it. So maybe let me ask you, Pablo, if you could tell us what you think from your perspective, the impact is that Ireland has had during its tenure on the UN Security Council with respect to gender-based violence and WPS. Um, and again, you know, given that we're focused on accountability, have you seen any positive impact or efforts towards accountability that you think um, were particularly well done um, or areas where really, you know, member states of the UN Security Council need to step up around accountability? Thank you so much. Um, yes. Ireland has performed incredibly, should be considered a model for all others to follow. And uh, all Irish people really should be very proud of their of how they're being represented by their diplomatic teams in New York and Dublin and the embassies on the ground. Uh, however, the Security Council is a, is a limited instrument, especially when great powers are involved, um, including the permanent members. So for the women on the ground, the last two years have been terrible years. Uh, and there are political trends that have a much greater influence on their lives than the decisions of the Security Council or what's spoken at the Security Council. So uh, the Security Council has said many good things about Afghans, Afghan women's rights and has tried uh, different kinds of things, but so far, it hasn't changed uh, the Taliban in their approach to women's rights uh, uh, in any way. And sexual violence, for example, has been uh, very, very prominent in the last two years in, 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 in almost all the conflicts, including the new uh, escalations in the DRC, in Haiti, uh, obviously Ukraine, Myanmar, you go down the list. We've seen increases of 30 and 40 percent of gender based violence in Mali, in the Central African Republic, um, um, and so on. Uh, but and, and and maybe the other thing to say is that the. Ireland has managed to advance the women, peace and security agenda in their two years in the council in a very difficult security council. I mean, some people are speaking about a new Cold War. Um, the council is uh, very divided on on many issues, and when when uh, Ireland entered the Security Council, the we had just had a great division within the council on a draft a Russian resolution on women, peace, and security uh, specifically just a few months ago. So um, it. We, you know, all of these results that we're talking about, all the records that Ireland broke as a co-chair of the of the IEG, 
all of the good decisions in the Security Council uh, happened in a very, very difficult context. So I think it took a, a higher level than of, of diplomatic skill and, and, and commitment. And, you know, the ambassador spoke of, uh, you know, some of the, 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 I guess, the high marks and the records. Um, we count those. But um, I would also say that their performance has been uh, uh, exceptional in the things that we can't count so easily. Uh, and he mentioned some of the follow up to all of the meetings, the things that happen behind closed doors or, you know, the initiatives that are a little bit less public. And those are extremely important for us. And, th you know, the results then, it, all, they often depend on the political will on the other side. But uh, for example, he mentioned that uh, he mentioned uh, approaching the the new Colombian government on 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 the gender provisions of the peace agreement. But there was also a request that women uh, participate in the negotiations in the new negotiations with the ELN, uh, which the first few meetings had had very few women, even though Colombia is sort of a uh, an exceptional uh, case and an example for the world in terms of women's participation in peace negotiations. And uh, you know, shortly after, doesn't shortly after this uh, letter was hand delivered to the foreign, the new foreign minister uh, uh, in his time in New York. Um, not necessarily because of that letter, but as part of uh, uh, a joint advocacy on this issue, the uh, government of Colombia appointed uh, four more women to their team, and they have now parity in their negotiating team, which is even better than how they did in in Havana. Uh, in the case of Yemen, for example, you know, you have an IEG meeting, but after the IEG meeting, the uh, the ambassadors took it upon themselves to write directly to the Yemeni government and to the, the Houthis in Yemen to explain what had been discussed uh, uh, in the meeting and to remind them of what the Security Council is saying about women and the 30% and things like that. And in that, you know, we have a, a more mixed record. Women continue to be ex excluded in many ways, but the Yemeni government, at least as of Two months ago was saying that they were incorporating two women to their negotiating team uh, now that the negotiations have uh, resumed and in the case of uh, Somalia for example uh, I think the foreign minister of Ireland also in his visit to Somalia really pushed for the 30 percent for women in the elections this was not achieved uh, but uh, Ireland was uh, very very vocal in supporting the the efforts of Somali women uh, on the ground to reach sort of a historic uh, uh, record in the in the elections, and I'd say maybe other another another thing. We count sometimes we count the references on women peace security in the resolutions, and that's not the best indicator. Uh, you know, you're you're better off making a more qualitative assessment of the strength uh, of these decisions. And in the last two years, the language on women, peace, and security in the decisions of the Security Council has been stronger than ever. Uh, and I can say that as somebody who has followed this for, for, for many years, uh, sometimes it's not a matter of, um, you know, uh, raising more issues or referencing uh, more women-related issues, but changing the verb. So not so much urging or calling for or recommending, but actually deciding, requesting, or demanding, you know, making it harder for the parties on the ground to ignore and easier for the advocates on the ground to hook onto those uh, decisions and use them as, as tools uh, in their work. And there were several positive examples. Uh, uh, you know, the ambassador mentioned uh, sanctions. Uh, you know, Ireland, I think, was, was crucial in... in um, supporting Afghan women's advocacy in that if they cannot move freely in their country, neither should the Taliban leadership uh, when the council was uh, deciding on the exemptions to the to, to the sanctions. Um, but also a Houthi leader, for example, uh, was the, the first sanctioned in many years in the Yemeni regime. And one of the main reasons was uh, uh, directing a campaign of sort of gender based persecu persecution against uh, women activists uh, in Yemen. Um, and apart from that, we have seen examples of where, you know, you'll see the council not just calling for women's participation, but actually strongly regretting that this hasn't happened yet and the, requesting to the parties that they come up with an action plan to get it done in the next three months or in the next six months. And an example of that is, is, uh, is Cyprus. Mm. 
Excellent, Pablo. That's, that's really interesting. I mean, I think what we're getting a sense of there is that, you know, that the words on the page matter, that the strength mm -hmm. of the words on the page matter, that they can be leveraged by civil society activists in the countries in question, um, that there is a level of accountability, albeit sometimes mm -hmm. hidden. Um, Colombia is a country where we did a listening session and we had very strong speakers from Colombia who spoke at length around the exclusion of women from the peace negotiations um, and how that was unfolding. So it is certainly very good to hear that I'm sure there are many other inputs to um, the Department of Foreign Affairs on that issue, as well as, of course, the embassy on the ground. But that that awareness led to an action which led to action is very, um, it's very good to hear. I just wonder, could you comment maybe, Pablo, from again, from the perspective, we're going to start opening up to questions now in a minute. Um, you know, what we're hearing, I suppose, particularly from Leila, is the failure of the UN institutions themselves to live up to their mandates. Um, you know, are there trends that you are seeing? Um, are there initiatives that are being taken that are helping to make UN agencies more robust or initiatives that need to be taken to help make UN agencies more robust in how they prevent gender-based violence, protect women, and help reinforce 1325? Um, our assessment, or at least the assessment of the annual report of the Secretary General on Women, Peace, and Security that was submitted to the Security Council, is that in the last uh, two years, the uh, UN entities, so beyond UN women, but you know all of the UN entities working on human rights and peace and security, um, were taking more robust measures to advance uh, women, peace and security. So in the context of the 20th anniversary, the Secretary General issued directives to the UN to improve their work on women, peace and security. And uh, these were slowly being taken up in the first year, I think more quickly in this uh, second year, we're, we're, we're certainly um, we're certainly seeing a trend in the right direction. However, I would say that in international policy making, we often do very little of something and expect these amazing results. Uh, so um, it's not so much a matter of finding other things, but to stick with what we are doing and doing it much more, you know, okay. uh, scaling it up uh, uh, essentially. Um, Otherwise, uh, our impact will still be marginal uh, in a world where um, a lot of the political trends are going in the opposite direction. Mm. Okay, thank you very much, Pablo. Okay, we're going to start opening up and taking some questions from the floor. So I have a number of questions that have already come in, but I'd encourage everyone to add any questions that you have to the questions and answers um, there that you can see at the bottom of your screen. So. I have a question here to our three female civil society briefers, and it's a question which asks quite simply, what does accountability mean to you in relation to women, peace and security? So I might just ask all of our speakers, maybe let me start um, with you, Mona, um, in very brief, if you could synopsize, what does accountability mean to you? Now, what I'm interpreting is, what does that mean to women who are affected? by gender-based violence. Um, in brief, Mona, what would you say in response to that question? Thank you. Actually, as I mentioned, uh, and when I speak uh, that uh, we suffering from, we are a double victim from occupation and patriarchal society, and we have violence from the occupation and violence from our society as, uh, our society is still it's a patriarchal society and we have discrimination and we don't have even a, a law that they protect us from violence this is many challenges we face but when i speak about accountability and what it means to me when you told me uh, what is the meaning of peace and security for you i will tell you i'm a woman uh, 48 years old i have never feel that I am in peace or in security at all. I raised up under occupation. I didn't see and, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm facing a lot of offenses and wars. And all the time, I feel that the international community will protect us or will not keep silent and will should uh, take Israel on, held to accountable for its crime. But all the time, unfortunately, 
I feel that we are alone. And that's why I, 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 I insist, insist when I speak about accountability. Accountability means to me that the, the, the international community don't allow that will not allow israel to to do the it's a crime again this is accountability to me thank you okay mona thank you so much and maybe let me go directly to charlene charlene just the same question to you what does accountability mean to you and to the women that you work with um Quiva, unfortunately i think um, charlene has dropped off Oh, that's a shame because I think we would have loved to have heard from Charlene. Mm -hmm. um, I think Charlene, there was always a risk we would lose Charlene because of connectivity. And she shared a few notes with us earlier. And a lot of it centered around um, accountability through the justice system. Um, but also accountability also means that women have access to services, that there is a that there is a responsibility towards women, which is met. Uh, but she reinforced time and again that the police who are responsible for protecting people, that there's an accountability issue there. There's a huge gap when women are being turned back and told that the violence, the rape that they have suffered is a matter that is a, a domestic concern and should be sorted out domestically. Um, but hopefully now we might get Charlene back so we can ask her that question. And Leila, could I ask you the same question? So in your context that you've set out really evocatively and clearly, what does accountability mean to you and to the women who are Palestinian refugees living in, in Lebanon? Accountability means, uh, first of all, uh, legal protection uh, framework for all uh, women residing in the country. Whether these are refugees, uh, displaced, as said, uh, resident women, and, uh, and equal legal framework, not discriminating women or favorit favoriting women against others, because here in, in the country, as you know, there are different personal status law and women are discriminated at different levels, uh, even between each others. So a full equal uh, uh, legal uh, prevention and the protection the laws that uh, benefiting all women residing in the country. This is one. Mm -hmm. Second, access to justice. Meaning justice for all women, whether these are uh, refugees or, or women in terms of access, because as said, we don't have access to justice. And uh, even if we reach uh, the courts, for instance, there is no equality in terms of uh, 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 treating women who are citizens and, and not citizens, residents, I mean, uh, equally. So equal in terms of access to justice, ac uh, equal in terms of justice itself between all, uh, all women. Accountability also means, as said, that uh, UN agencies uh, that are responsible on Palestinian refugee women should be accountable to all UN uh, uh, instruments and uh, and uh, resolutions, statements, etc. They have to be accountable for this. Yeah. Uh, mainly in terms of the protection and the prevention at both uh, sides. Well, finally, it means uh, it should be accountable from all political uh, decision makers uh, level, whether these are PLO or the Palestinian Authority, to be accountable to their international commitments, mm -hmm. 1325 mainly, etc. And for sure, that means mainstreaming gender equality in all at all levels, uh, different ministries in all legal uh, frames and laws. Leila, thank you very much. I think it's really interesting listening to the two of you. Um, Mona, on the one hand, what you set out is really the need for broad accountability in terms of the overall political situation and how it impacts on the country. And as we've heard earlier, the disproportionate impact on women then is extremely grave. I think it's really striking to hear you say that at the age of 48, you've never lived in peace and security. 
So what does peace and security mean? What would that even look like? What would that feel like for you and for women in Palestine, whether in the West Bank, East Jerusalem or Gaza? Um, I suppose it has to start with the question of the accountability of the international community towards um, the illegal occupation. Um, but then even within that, and I think, Leila, you picked this up as well, even within that, there's accountability by all political actors for what they're failing to do, for the policies that they have subscribed to internationally that they're not implementing. Um, and I, I think I maybe, um, Fergal, I'll come back to you. You know, I think there is this question that comes up, and again, Leila mentioned it very clearly, and it is a specific issue in a specific context, but it does seem that, you know, the UN agencies, well, it's great to hear that Pablo is saying that the report is, is showing that maybe it's as a result of the reinforcement of the importance of um, acting on the WPS mandate that this is starting to see an improvement. But I wonder from Ireland's perspective, having let out so strongly on this over the last two years, and I know that a huge part of that has been holding the UN agencies themselves accountable by asking UN mm -hmm. leaders to come in and to, to account for their work mm -hmm. um, at the IEG. What are the trends that you are seeing? Where are, the, where are the bright spots and where are the areas that really need a lot more pressure? Thanks. Yeah, I might, I might just uh, just set out a few a few responses there. I mean, firstly, in, in relation to accountability, I mean, for us, accountability is listening to women like we have in the call, like we had through the listening exercises organised by the consortium, and then implementing what they truly need, not what we think here sitting in our offices in New York, but actually what people on the ground need in real situations, bringing that into the UN system as best we can, and also ensuring the resources are on the ground to carry out implementation. I think resources is very important. And that's an area that we often see under attack, particularly in the FIP committee here in New York, where you know resolutions are agreed, actions are agreed, and then there's rollback when it comes to actual resourcing itself and resourcing UN missions. And of course, accountability means working against persistent impunity of crimes. Where have we worked on that? We've worked on that in the Afghanistan mandate in particular, very close with Norway, a very strong uh, mandate for women and children. Obviously, an awful long way to go, extremely challenged situation, but it's in the mandate. You know, we, we, we brought that in our focus on, on Haiti, Mali, Central African Republic, the conflict in Ethiopia, huge gender based violence in that conflict, Ukraine and Afghanistan, as I mentioned. So it's across the board uh, and the Middle East. And I come back to the Middle East in a moment. Um, so that's very important for us as implementation, and it's also calling to account. And, I, you know, I look at, um, you know, What's our focus been? It's been advocacy, accountability, and then action. Uh, and that's very, very important for us. And I think Pablo mentioned there our work in relation to the Taliban travel ban. That's just an example where we said no. Um, you know, as Pablo said, if, if, if women and children can't travel, if their rights are being restricted quite very severely and that's ongoing, then why should the Taliban leaders who are doing that denial of rights be allowed to travel freely without, without impediment? As if, as if nothing has happened. And so that was one area where we actually really stand our ground on the council and mm. say, this is, this is important. And that's just one example of, of action. Um, working with the UN agencies, I mean, that, that's really, really important. They're operating in the field. They face many, many challenges. They're trying to operate very often in environments where they're trying to work with the local authorities uh, who are not supportive of their work, particularly in relation to women and children and WPC security. And yet they have the mandate and so for us, it's not about um, it, it's it's not about uh, a blame game. It's about just really ensuring this accountability, really ensuring this is on the agenda, really ensuring that mandates are being fulfilled uh, in a cooperative, collaborative fashion. Uh, and we've had that with many, many agencies through those IEG um, uh, dialogues and engagement. So it's it's advocacy. It's calling out. It's ensuring there's not impunity. It's ensuring we're shining a light on really, really appalling situations uh, across the globe. And then it's trying to ensure action, implementation, funding uh, across the board. That's, that's, that's a, 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 in a nutshell, what we're trying to do, what we've been trying to do. And um, we'll continue doing off the council um, mm. in, in fifth committee, in third committee. You know, I think you spoke earlier, Quiv, about the sense of, you know, a strong pushback against human rights norms, against human rights language against uh, advances we thought we'd all made in particularly in relation to women's peace and security, uh, women's rights. There's a pushback there in the UN system and we have to fight that each and every day in, in, the, in, the, in the councils here, not just security council, but across the board. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's very, very important too. So, 
and that work will continue. Just in relation to the Middle East, and, and um, mm -hmm. I think one of your speakers spoke about uh, Shirin Abu Akhla, uh, and you know uh, her, 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 her death. We've really brought sought to bring that onto the Security Council agenda. Uh, that's not easy. Everyone knows the dynamics, the geopolitical dynamics in relation to the Middle East on the Security Council. But we've we've worked might and main in relation to bringing accountability and an investigation for uh, Shirin's death. Uh, uh, but also we, we've worked on the wider issue of protection of journalists because a free independent media is absolutely essential to keeping a light on, on, on activities across the board. Uh, thirdly, we very much see WP, uh, Women, Peace and Security as not just about um, shining a light on, on attacks and the denial of rights, women and children, but also ensuring in a very meaningful way the empowerment of women, that women are in the room they're at the table when it comes to peace negotiations, that that perspective is there at every turn. And we've worked to ensure that all our geographical teams here in the mission have that WP security focus in their work. So it's not siloed mm -hmm. here in the mission in our Security Council work, and it's not siloed in the, in the UN Security Council agenda. Some member states around that table uh, were happy for a, a once a year open debate in WP security, leave it in that box. That's, that's, that's that ticked and covered. And we've really worked both myself and uh, my predecessor, Geraldine, and our teams, Quiva Nicrahur, Fiona Broderick, working might and main to ensure that it's, it's, it's in every debate, every agenda, every sanctions uh, regime. Uh, and it's not just put into a little corner where we can say we've ticked that box. Mm. Thank you. Now, thanks for that, Fergal. I think that's really striking, a number of things that you said, because there are some elements in there that um, help us to start thinking about advocacy and how advocacy can be effective. And some things are very practical. Um, so, you know, the first is that there's there's really no point in having strong language unless there's the resources to enforce it yeah. and to enable yeah. that enforcement. So from a civil society perspective, monitoring and tracking language, be it in a country specific file or be it on a resolution, and then seeing, well, is that being backed up by the allocation of resources? Um, I am, I'm imagining, but let me come to Pablo on this, I'm imagining that it's helpful if civil society organises from outside the UN system and puts pressure on the UN system and the UNSC member states um, to ensure that the resourcing comes to fruition. Um, but also I'm imagining that the importance of shining a light on these issues just cannot be overstated, um, particularly when there are so many forces that are arraigned against that and that are trying to avoid having these issues come to the fore. So maybe, Pablo, I might just come back to you. So in terms of what can civil society organisations, including both those like members of the Irish Consortium on Gender-Based Violence that are based in Ireland, but also civil society organisations like those represented by Mona, by Charlene, by Leila, what are some of the most impactful actions that we can take to keep women, peace and security on the agenda and to have effective action taken? Well, I will say that um, in in general, the you know we always hear that the UN uh, needs to engage systematically and meaningfully with uh, civil society, and uh, often people at the UN feel like that's one of the main things they do. But uh, our partners in civil society don't feel that way. Uh, don't feel that this engagement is all that meaningful. And that in many cases, it's more performative or ad hoc or tokenistic. And um, I'm sure there are good and bad examples, but um, I will say the ambassador mentioned that they have been uh, speaking regularly with Afghan women leaders since the takeover of the Taliban. Uh, we've been privileged to be part of those meetings. And, you know, I've been working on this for many years and I've had colleagues from the UN after those meetings turn to me and say, you know, that's what meaningful engagement looks like. Uh, you know, and a, co a conversation between equals where they're both sharing strategic information uh, that is helpful for both parties. Um, 
So more of that, I mean, it's not, it's not easy. I mean, it takes a, a, a significant uh, investment from, from everybody, from the, both the women activists who are very busy already, and as well as the decision makers and the, you know, the people in the foreign ministries and, and, and the ambassadors, etc. But uh, none of this is, I mean, none of this is very easy. Like if you ask, you're asking about resources, um, I would say that in a context of uh, so many military coups and seizures of power by force, um, and in a context in which we have evidence that the biggest difference uh, uh, in, you know, to prevent violence against women is, is determined by the strength of the women's movement on the ground and not by anything else, not even by the laws or, you know, obviously not by the decisions of the Security Council. Uh, it is more urgent than ever than that women's organizations are actually funded. And yeah. in that context, in the past year, we actually saw a regression. Uh, women's organizations in conflict and fragile uh, settings received less money. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, I'm sure that some of that was marked by places like Afghanistan, where you know, something like close to 80% of women's organizations are no longer receiving funding and no longer running projects. Uh, so it is in these uh, situations where it's more important than ever to, to fund women's organizations directly. And this isn't easy either, mm -hmm. uh, because in some of these contexts, uh, channeling funds to women's organizations can put them at risk. Uh, there are procedures in, in place that make it uh, especially hard. And so these are things that the UN needs to work out. And we created a, a Women's Peace and Humanitarian Fund precisely to figure out some of these things. And they, uh, I'm happy to say Ireland was an early supporter of this fund. This fund is growing rapidly. And uh, they've already supported 600, women, 600 uh, women's organizations in the last uh, four or five years. And uh, more than half of them received UN funds for the first time, which is a, a very strong indicator that, uh, you know, this is this mechanism uh, is, is working. But Ukraine, it, you know, and the, the invasion of Ukraine and the, the reaction to it is mopping up a lot of the funds uh, that are available in ODA in the countries that normally support these things. Uh, so that is going to be very difficult. Someone in the in the chat was asking about what else can the Security Council do. Again, none of these questions are that um, easy to answer. Uh, the the Security Council and the Human Rights Council have been supporting accountability for SGBV much more strongly in the last uh, uh, ten or twelve years, and that has made a difference. Uh, ten or twelve years ago, we used to say, you know, this is history's greatest silence, the least condemned war crime, and all of these things. I'm not sure we can say that now. These atrocities are now being thoroughly documented and investigated. Uh, UN Women deploys something like twenty to twenty-five, sometimes thirty, experts on investigations of gender-based violence to the commissions of inquiry, the fact-finding missions, the ICC investigations. The you know the sanctions uh, the, the the panels monitoring the sanctions committees are providing evidence of uh, of all of all of, of all of these things. This is being documented, but what we're not seeing is the actual justice uh, for women. Uh, so that gap in some ways has grown because we have more information than ever, but the outcomes are actually very limited. And that's not something that the Security Council can do so much can do so much about. You asked earlier also about. Uh, you know, pushback from the UN and what else can the UN? The ambassador mentioned that um, they've been pushing the Secretary General on, uh, you know, leading by example or ha having maybe a hard requirement in, in peace negotiations for women to be there. There's strong pressure from uh, mediators on the ground uh, to not have a red line or a condition. Uh, that uh, requiring women to per to participate in peace negotiations. Uh, because this requires the consent of the parties engaging in mediation, uh, could result in, in you know, the UN losing its role uh, or its space uh, and ceding this space to worse actors. Uh, I disagree with this argument, but I, I, you know, I'm not, I don't work in mediation, so that's maybe an argument to be won or lost over the next uh, 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 coming years. 
But then another one is another of our instruments that we do have, you know, because the Security Council will mandate peacekeeping uh, missions and the mandates of these peacekeeping missions. Sometimes, you know, in the, in the DRC, for example, the UN peacekeeping mission is being is receiving a lot of pushback. They want it out. They want it want it out of there. Uh, and this happens in other countries as well. And the same thing happens with sanctions. We can say we want more sanctions on on these uh, people who violate women's rights. Um, but it is not clear that sanctions are effective. Uh, it is not in the literature, at least. It's not clear that women's rights organizations want more sanctions. Often they are divided on this issue. There we've seen contexts in which women's rights organizations are pushing for fewer sanctions because the sanctions are actually having a, a negative impact on their way of operating uh, in the country uh, or can put them at, at risk. Um, so it is it's 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 a it's a it's a it's a tall order in a in a sense. Mm -hmm. But I do think that the the what I said before about stronger language uh, and more concrete, more specific language is still something that can be achieved and that can uh, make a difference. So when I mentioned that the countries the council is being more prescriptive and more assertive in deciding, requesting, or demanding, that has happened only a couple of times in the last two years, two or three times, hadn't happened before. Uh, but that's an example to follow uh, into the future and try to have that in 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 more contexts. Because just calling for women's participation in you know in statement after statement or resolution after resolution doesn't make a huge difference. It's somewhat helpful, uh, but when you're demanding it in a specific, like say the Nairobi process now being facilitated by the EAC in, in on on you know on the Congo or you know whichever process. Uh, it becomes more helpful, and in that sense, I would encourage Ireland to continue. I know they're doing they're doing this, but I would encourage them to continue to work with the uh, ones outside of the council too, the new, with the new members of the Security Council. Uh, there are many ways of doing this. I will continue to share our assessment of what's happening in the council with Ireland, so that they can uh, use it in uh, whichever forums uh, and and spaces that they are in, um, and. Um, you know, obviously through the European Union and other the, some of the global mechanisms on women, peace and security, uh, I would encourage them uh, to do so as well. But I, but again, go, going back to the resources, I, I heard Ireland commit to uh, raising $50 million for feminist organizations uh, over the next uh, five years. Uh, we need much more of much more of that. Uh, uh, you know, we we should be raising more like a billion dollars, you know, uh, there's the, there's the demand for that. There's the capacity to absorb that. Uh, it's just uh, a difficult moment for ODA in general uh, at the time, uh, but it is the fight that we need to push just as much as the words in the Security Council. Okay, thank you so much, Pablo. Um, I want to come back. We're moving towards a close here now. Unfortunately, we've run out of time very quickly in these sessions, but I want to bring Mona and Leila back in. And maybe we've, we've heard quite a lot here now. So Maybe Mona and Leila, if I could just ask you to respond on any points that you particularly want to respond on, and maybe just to end by saying, well, what is the one thing that you think the consortium, which is a mixture of the Irish government, our defence forces and civil society in Ireland, what is the one thing that the Irish consortium should do to help improve accountability and end impunity? So maybe, Mona, let me start with you again first. Thank you. I will end by saying victims are victims wherever in this world. And double standards should not have a place in justice. Ukraine deserves justice. Yemen deserves justice. Afghanistan deserves justice. And certainly, Palestine deserves justice too. So we need justice, protection, dignity. So. Uh, please don't let us disbelieve in the international community and its support and solidarity. And don't let us disbelieve also with the UN system. Bring justice and uh, uh, dignity for Palestinian women. Thank you. Mona, thank you so much. I think those words resonate very strongly. We need to keep faith with the people of Palestine. Um, okay, Leila, would you like to come in? Yeah, I, I believe that uh, 
what is mentioned is important, but also I believe that, uh, first of all, the monitoring system of the UN Security Council should be much more restricted. Uh, I know that there are reports from UN agencies, which is totally important on women's peace and security, I mean. But these are not enough because uh, people who are on the ground, especially the activists, women activists, they have also a lot of evidence that um, uh, not all UN agencies are fulfilling the obligations that have to do. Uh, so much more, I don't want to say restricted, but much more accountable monitoring system should be done and, and carried out. This is first to second. Uh, I believe that the missions uh, uh, is so important, especially when they are uh, uh, produce reports, but also producing reports in addition to producing reports, I have to say that recommendations based on their missions should be delivered to the, uh, to the National Council but also to the countries that they have visited and the uh, relevant decision makers and, and, uh, and bodies. Thank Excellent, you. Excellent, Leila. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not going to attempt to summarize some of the themes. Um, we are taking notes here in the Irish Consortium of the staff in the background. So we will send a communication out afterwards. But I think this has been a very interesting discussion. I think it represents the quality of the discussion that we've had over the last two years, which is in effect based on um, an atmosphere of trust and openness between civil society, the defence forces, the Irish government. I think the fact is that we are aligned in our vision and what we want to achieve, and we all have different roles to play, which is what makes the Irish consortium both special and strong. Um, I think the key strength that we have is our common belief that we need to hear the voices of female civil society leaders from the context in which they are, and that we need to not just listen, but to really hear, absorb, and act, and be accountable back to our, our partners, our colleagues, our, our sisters, Mona, Leila, Charlene, you are three amongst many, many people whom the Irish government has engaged with, but the Irish NGO structure, the Irish Defence Force structure, we engage with many, many women. And it is our responsibility to be accountable to raise the issues that you are putting mm. forward and also to create more and more space for you. I, I think I'm struck by what Pablo said as well about the, um, the lack of funding for women-led and women-centred organisations. That's certainly something that I think collectively in Ireland as an ecosystem, we feel very strongly about and feel very strongly that that needs to change. The fact that there's such a paucity of funding to women-centred and women-led mm -hmm. organisations, particularly in conflict-affected environments, is something that needs to be addressed with some urgency. So I will draw to a close here. I will thank all of our panel of excellent speakers for your time, for your engagement, for the thought and consideration that you've given in preparing this session and being with us today. Um, I'd like to thank all of the participants who came, who've been thoughtfully in the background absorbing everything that you're hearing, who've contributed questions. And I would particularly like to thank the staff of the Irish Consortium on Gender-Based Violence, the acting coordinator, Anya Hanrahan, Yule as well, Yule Zeshki, who has been working very hard to deliver this session today. And I would also like to welcome Jennifer McCarthy Flynn, who is our new incoming coordinator and who's been listening and absorbing everything that has been saying, said here because our mandate now is to take this forward. We've heard what accountability means um, to you and our mandate is to go ahead and drive that agenda quite strongly into the future. So thank you all, one and all, for your participation. We will send you the briefing that will follow very shortly, um, essentially summarizing the issues that arose in the listening sessions and what women want us to prioritize in our work and in our advocacy. Thank you, one and all. Very much appreciate all of your participation today and you. wish you well. Thank, Thank you all. You. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.